Good evening, folks. Welcome back. This is your half hour call. Half hour, please. Half hour. Good evening, folks. I'm Kurt Columbus, Artistic Director at Trinity Repertory Company. Welcome to our half hour call and thank you to our sponsor tonight, Washington Trust. Thanks for being with us and with my guest, the indomitable, the inimitable, the incredible Laura Smith. Hello, Laura Thank Smith. You. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Of course, my pleasure. I get to wear makeup again. It's nice. <laughs> it's so nice. Um, so for folks who don't know, Laura Smith is our production director and has been uh, for 20-ish years. Well, <laughs> I started off in 1996 as the assistant production director and then a uh, year before you started became the production director. So 13 years? No, dear. 14, 16. 15. 16. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank so, you and good night. <laughs> and scene. And um, scene. Uh, so tell me, what does a production director do, Laura Smith? Well, um, we do lots of things. Uh, starting off, we do the schedule uh, for the entire season, the performance schedule for the entire season. And then I work with you with season planning and reading the plays, but then budgeting them. So then I'm also responsible for creating the entire production department for a uh, production budget for the entire uh, season. Uh, and then I hire and negotiate all the directors and designers and outside actors that we work with. Um, I work with all of the three unions that we work with. I do all of that contracting uh, and everything like that. And then the best part about it is I get to produce all the plays uh, with an absolutely incredibly talented group of people uh, that I miss every day. Um, and then I just spend the day fixing things. I do I fix a lot? <laughs> you're yeah, you're a fixer. You also you also spend a lot of the day causing me grief. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I I wanted to say uh, Laura Smith's favorite phrase is I love you but and then the but is there are the <laughs> things you can't do yes. right and, yes I love uh, having an office next to you so when someone leaves I walk in and go okay no I love you but <laughs> I can't do that that okay. happens daily yeah yeah um so uh, before we get started into our conversation, I wanted to lay in here this, which is if you have questions for Laura Smith, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat in Facebook Live and we will get them to us and we'll answer your questions after we have our conversation. Thanks. Uh, okay, so tonight, Laura, we're gonna talk about, there are so many elements to production that we can talk about, right? Lighting, sound, yeah, costumes. costumes. Yeah. Um, special effects, uh, uh, projections. But tonight we're gonna talk about scenery and the physical elements that make up the stage space, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, you and I decided to do this because there's a, there's a long standing lore at Trinity Rep about the way that the scenery helps us to make the plays that we do, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's not, like at a lot of other theaters where the, the you walk in and the scenery represents some actual thing. Mm -hmm. Often the scenery is a is a space that's entirely unexpected. And I can remember coming to Trinity Rep 15 years ago and having uh, someone say to me, oh, I wish you'd been here for Billy Bishop Goes to War. And we have a slide from that. Peter, if you can show this slide. There's the great Peter Garrity, directed by Richard Jenkins, set by Eugene Lee. Um, and 1982-83, um, Richard Jenkins said he read the play, and it's about a, a, a World War I pilot, right? Oh. Who's um, telling war stories. And Richard said he read the play and he thought, I don't, I don't know what to what to do. Eugene read it and he said, Well, oh, darling, it's set in a bar. It's in a bar. Yeah. So he took the Dowling Theater. He tore it out and he made a bar. And Peter Garrity every night came in and told his war stories in a bar. And yes. it is such a brilliant uh, um, container for that story. Um, and it's, it's definitive in the way that, that um, 
Trinity's aesthetic has grown up over the years, right? Yeah, it's ingrained. That's that's just who we are and have always been uh, since the beginning uh, of, of it. Uh, is it's just taking a story and telling it, kind of stripped down in a sense, um, and and you know leaving all of that you know, woo, you know somewhere else. Uh, yeah, moving scenery, all of that other stuff. Yeah. You don't need it. You need an actor and an audience, yeah. right? Yeah. To make a play happen. And the container, uh, the bar container is something actually we've used more than once. I was, I was talking to Richard Jenkins the other night. He said, yeah, it worked so well in Billy Bishop. We did it again for Lady Day Sings the Blues and there was a giant hit. And, and Grapes, Grapes of, of Rat. Well, I mean, just an absolutely incredible play that I do not believe the audience would have left feeling the way that they did if it was just, you know, I'm sitting here and you're and you're there doing your thing. I mean, it was it was beautiful, but a bar. It took place all around. They used they walked on the bar. I remember in them and that was a Michael McGarty set, I think. Yes. That that back mural that he had made mm -hmm. a kind of WPA sort of mural so that you were you were simultaneously in the period. But then we had a contemporary rock band as you would have in a, in a dive bar. It was. <laughs> it was, I mean, and, and you know, being a production director and part of that, you see the show a number of times, uh, teching it and the previews and all of that stuff like that. And there was just moments of that play, like when we built the, uh, the car, the, you know, the right. van that everyone was going that, the baby, when the baby was going down there. I mean, I, it's just like, you know, tears just come up because it's just such simple, beautiful storytelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stagecraft at its best. So, yeah. so you got here um, a, a century ago, and <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, twenty-six years is a century in the theater in the theater world. Uh, and and in your first season, um, uh, what's the show that stands out for you uh, in this discussion around how we remade the space? Well, there's a lot. The one that, you know, we start like St. Joan, My Fair Lady, all of those were, I had no clue about Trinity when I interviewed for the job and got started. And then I'm thrown into this absolutely incredible whirlwind of a moving the theater around every time you did something. But Virginia Woolf is one of the first ones that just, I sat there uh, in, in, in this photo, I sat in one of those chairs behind the bar uh, for one of the previews and uh, you're, it's frightening. You were, in, you were in that crazy living room um, with these two people. And it was just, it was, I will never forget sitting, sitting in that audience watching that happen. Um, well, and it just kind of shifted the whole theater around. And if you look at that photograph and you can see, you know, there's a door, but there are no walls, right? And no. so it's as if the walls have been blown away. And, and, that, and those were in the house uh, left side of the theater. So we just kind of took the set and just kind of went like this and built, you know, seats upstage where you would normally be. Uh, and then that became the front door. Um, and it was, it was crazy. It was wonderful. It was amazing. And, you know, in like Trinity fashion, we act in the aisles. We're all over the place. Um, but that was one of the first ones of just watching five, you know, three feet away from you, just uh, an incredible, incredible production. So was there, was there another show where you went, uh, Wow, we're moving the the scenery around in a way that, and or or we're not moving the scenery around. We're we're changing the audience perspective in a way that I had never imagined. Yeah, I mean, this is one of my leading favorites. question. Leading yes. question. <laughs> I know the answer. Uh, yes, noises off. Amanda Daynert's uh, noises off, uh, designed by David Jenkins. I this is one of those. Uh, I mean, we'll set it up. So Noises Off happens in three acts. And the first act is the audience sitting watching a, 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 a technical rehearsal. rehearsal happening on the set. And all of the, you know, hilarity with that. And then an intermission happens. And then the audience watches 
the backstage of a performance and then the performance just going wrong and they were backstage and then another intermission happens and the audience sees that that performance that they just saw from backstage they see it uh you know the actual performance as audience members so most theaters will take this and they do a turntable to where you know you have the set and all of that stuff intermission happens it turns around you go back to your same seat and and then you watch that intermission happens turntable around we ripped out the entire here you go we ripped out the entire uh chase theater except for the concrete um uh, balcony there and we reconfigured it and built the set kind of in the middle of the space uh and we had you know around 400 seats um and then so you know you can see where the audience is and that would be you know act one and that's the stage but then at the first intermission we had little ushers come out and say you know here's the deal at intermission you have a color coded card on your armrest that's the color that you're going to go find when uh backstage uh at the end of intermission so we actually had those 400 people move to the actual backstage uh and watch <laughs> the actual backstage uh, and that, watch act two and then at the third intermission go back to the seats that they're originally in to, to watch that and it was it was absolutely I mean it was a feat it was crazy uh, but it was truly remarkable and you know what what great. does it what does it do okay so you sat in that audience what does it do it's 2001 um, you know the it opened right around September 11th and the uh, the, the company talk about how um, a lot of company members were in that, um, uh, Timmy Crow, uh, uh, Angela Brazil, Steve Thorne, Mara Hantman, um, uh, Janice Duclos, Stephen Berenson, uh, Cynthia Strickland. Um, and they, they would all talk about how uh, deeply felt that play was at that time, because it's all, it's just such a glorious play. But, but do you think, anything changed by actually having people get up and move backstage and instead of just sitting there and having the, the set turn around? Well, I mean, we, we, you know, we made some people unhappy. <laughs> there were a couple of times where people refused to go back there and they just watched the second act from their normal seat. Albeit, yes, we were asking you to sit on wooden bleachers and those are uncomfortable. But, but for me, it's, it's, but yeah. hang on, the, the people that stayed there, they got to see, because we yeah. did the production on yeah. the stage, right? Yeah, yeah. so they so, were seeing it from, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Right. So they got uh, to see a performance, just not the full thing, because you have to go backstage to see the full thing, right? Yeah. But for me, they were backstage, and yeah, they were on wooden risers, because it's backstage, and, yeah. and you're not in your cushiony little theater seat. It, you're in, you were, you were in the backstage area. Yeah. You, once again, we use this all the time. You you were immersed in the play, um, and I apologize for it being incredibly uncomfortable. But it's but I don't <laughs> think that that I I think actually people love that sort of thing because you're asking them to participate, and everyone wants to go backstage. We hear that all the time. Um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, we've already got a question. Oh. Look at this. You're that popular. Oh my uh, A question from a gentleman named Jim Briggs. What was your favorite set or setting? Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, okay. And we can come back to that. You can think yeah, about gonna, that. Well, we're going to talk about it. I, we're going to talk about it well, later. I know we are. Yes, yeah. you're right. OK, OK, Jim, we're going to get to your question. We'll Stay there. tuned. We'll, we'll come back to this. Uh, OK, now I'd like to go from the ridiculous to the impossible. Right, so getting an audience up, moving them around in order to watch noises off, and then moving them back around to watch noises off. Um, uh, we're going to watch a little bit from King Lear. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to set it up too much, um, Peter. Let's play that clip. Shut up your doors, my lady. It's a wild night. My reading counsels well from out of the storm. I beg thee, give me leave to help the king. Most faithful Gloucester, 
on pain of our perpetual displeasure, I charge thee neither to speak of him, and treat for him, or in any way sustain him further. Some of the coolest stagecraft I, I've ever had the pleasure to enjoy. That was a, that was a that was a lot of fun, and it was very difficult. Not so much the walls because that's gravity. I mean, that was you know that's right. that. But I, I I will never forget Carl Oral, who was the technical director at the time. He walks into my office knowing I was just going to be like, no. He walks in. He's like, I got a good one for you. I got one for you. And I'm like, what, Carl? He goes, so. Uh, Kevin and Michael want uh, all of the walls to fall um, in all different directions uh, right before the storm. And I was like, cool. I was like, oh my God, yes. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yes, really. Let's figure that out. Now, when we were first talking about that, Kevin was very adamant of, he did not want water. He didn't want rain. He wanted something more theatrical than rain. Right. Sound, lighting, fog. Okay, sure. yes, yeah. Exactly. No, I, 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 I was there. Yeah. there. I remember. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It ended up raining for four, almost 14 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I remember that too. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, uh, just a deluge. I, this is one of those moments where, uh, where the stage scenery also um it just it's so reflective of the character's inner state right mm -hmm. and so what you you've got a couple of things going on you have edmund's line that old age doth fall and you know the the the, the that is the throne room where we first see lear but then it's also lear's mind where the walls have all tumbled down mm -hmm. and so they fall to reveal lear in his madness yeah. and the storm and it was just like it, it, it's giving me chills actually even to talk about it because that that rain, I still remember the rain falling. I remember being in that room and and feeling that wind, right? And his his first line is blow wind crack cheeks. Yeah. And I think we have the other video that truly shows what the audience felt. The audience, because that, that camera was so far away, but uh, the other yeah. video truly shows kind of, what was happening to the front couple of rows. Great, let's roll that peep. It's very easy to make a wall fall once. Then get broken 
down and ship 1,700 miles to Dallas, there's a different challenge there. <laughs> Thank you, Mark Turek. Nice yeah. to have Mark Turek in our little evening yes, together. I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Mark talks about some of the challenges because it wasn't, this was a collaboration with the Dallas Theater Center, right? Yes, it was a, it was a co-production. So it started here and then it was going, uh, it was going to Dallas and then running in Dallas's theater. And lots of theaters do co-production. They are very tough uh, just because theater spaces are not the same. And there's not a lot of theater spaces like the Dowling. Um, it's its own little weird thing. Uh, so that was a challenge. Uh, in itself. And it was also a challenge of building something that then constantly needed to be changed or rethought at, at the last moment to, I mean, I, I, and I will take some, I will take a lot of responsibility. So, you know, this is one of those production directors, you know, which way do you go? And, and my philosophy is I never want to go no. Uh, I, that never wants to be, I mean, sometimes that is the immediate, I, I only, to you, lot. only to you, it's okay. like, you know, but it's like a pastime. Uh, <laughs> but I want to, I want to see if there's something that we can do, uh, because it may not be exactly the way it's explained to us, but maybe there's a way that we can collaborate and discuss and, and work on things to make it happen in some way. But there is a time in which that you're too far past that. And for me, I got caught up in wanting to make everything that needed to happen for that. So it's like, you know, we built a set. Uh, yes, we used marine ply because we had an idea there might be some water, but not 14 minutes of water. Uh, and so it was caulked, it was leaking. We had to get vacuums that, you know, oh, it was just, you know, at some point I needed to step up and go, okay. Kevin, we can't accomplish that. But no, I kept going until opening night. <laughs> I was like, we're... and it was spectacular. I mean, this is the thing, you know, that, that part of part part of the experience of going to the live theater is the liveness of it, mm -hmm. is the way that things might mess up. It's yeah. the way that things um, require hand making, uh, 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 hand installing. You know, someone standing backstage and pulling those lines that then release the walls, right? Yeah. Or they may have been solenoids, but yeah. you know what I mean? Like- We're fancy every once in a while. <laughs> we're fancy every once in a while. But, it, but it's, it's um, kind of, um, uh, without that, why go, right? Because movies can do all of the other stuff yeah. ever so much better. Well, and it's like Peter Pan, our, our production of Peter Pan, it, you know, it's kind of like, you know, yeah, we had these big white ropes come down, we hooked people up, and people laid on their back and swung them in a circle, and and it was glorious, and, and once again, that's what theater asks you to do, it's not the movies, you have to suspend your belief on certain, and you have to be in make-believe and, and all of that stuff, and that's you know, and that's the fun part about it. And to me, you know, we don't have a lot of the bells and whistles that a lot of theaters have. You know, I, you know, I remember you coming back oh, from, from the store and like, and then the room rotated around, and I'm like, I can't do that. Well, I, but, no, I, I remember the moving scenery we used to have at Sepulchre. Where they'd be like, and go, and the walls would just do this, and the right. Yeah, yeah. yeah we have people. You know, and, and, you know, so yes, there's a time in which that would make things easier. But I also think that old school way of telling a story um, is, yeah. is just sometimes just beautiful. It's just well, beautiful. You just said something really important that, that I hadn't even really. Say that considered. again. Say that again. You <laughs> actually said something important. I know, I know. I'm, I'm calling it out. Um, that, that, which was that, that, uh, that you have to be part of the play and using that in the sense the way that children play right yes. um i think we're often most successful when the we we have that kind of uh uh play playfulness mm -hmm. and in fact this is oh look at us we're so good this is a great segue for our next clip peter let's play this clip from midsummer night's dream uh directed by tyler dabrowski and set by michael mcgarty uh yeah you can run it whenever you're ready bud
I love that clip because it's during a student matinee and the kids are like, what, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> We're being spun around? What, these people are insane. And it was just so brilliant. Uh, again, sense of play, simple stagecraft, and, and, a, and a really, you know, it's that, it's always that challenge of that play, right? You go from Athens and the, and the rigid, the rigidness of Athens. And all we did was sort of put things as a, a, a skew a little bit and suddenly we're in the forest. And all the things, yes, yeah. And, uh, and also Brian McElhaney, uh, we had moving scenery in the Dowling Theater, which is a little bit trickier because it's so much smaller for all the King's men uh, back then, but it was great because there was a, you know, there was a, I think a scene where it's like a football game or something. So we could move the seating risers yep. to be like stadium seating uh, and all of that stuff like that. And just, you yep, know, yep. it was a powerful, it was a powerful, the, you know, set element to tell the story. Yeah. I, I, I just, um, I love again, the playfulness and the way that in that particular clip, all of the elements of production are at play, right? Yes. Lights, the sound, the sets, the costumes. Yeah. And, and they're all participating in my sense of the magical, mm -hmm. which, um, which is part of what is so great about the theater. Okay. So now I think we're going to get to what may be your favorite set. Is that right? Well, no, King Lear was my favorite set. I apologize. King Lear was my favorite set. That was that, and be, and also just because of the the carpet padding, which we use a lot to make look like plaster that was on the back wall, and just the Seth uh, Riser did, did the lighting design of that, and the way that he sculpted that space and that set, especially once the walls came down, uh, oh. just I just thought was like that is. It just, was just beautiful. This, this is as a, not a lot of production directors get a chance to do this next feat. Um, and once again, it was with Brian McElhaney who can figure out anything. Um, well, and I still remember when I came into your office and I said, so I have two plays for you to read, <laughs> but they're happening in uh, both theaters at the same time. And I was like crazy. And I think I read 10 pages of both of them next to each other. And I stopped and I walked back into your office and I said, we're doing this. <laughs> I was like, I don't care how much it costs. We will figure it out. We, we are doing these plays. Because so for the, yeah. the longtime folks who are watching tonight, this is of course House and Garden by Alan Akeborn. Uh, it, it's, um, it's two separate plays. One takes place in the house. The other one takes place in the garden. Um, and uh, they take place simultaneously with one cast between two theaters, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And it's, that's- it's like, the how, how awesome is that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Peter, let's play this, the clip where we're gonna watch um, Steve Thorne uh, leave garden and enter house. Whenever you're ready, Peter. Well, must you not excuse me? So you tell that dog of yours, you tell that pearl that I want her in peak form today, okay? As far as her silver service goes, she'd better set about raising her game. Don't want to repeat of Christmas lunch last year with the Lord Lieutenant. Still that bloody Brussels sprout stuff in the ceiling in there. <laughs> Don't want that again. Say something. <laughs> Never mind. I shut this door right. so Pearl can get all of the room for in there. Right. She she oh dear, she's on the wall. She don't know where she's going. Right. It's a feet nailing to the ground, that one. That'll fuck. Yeah, I'm working on that. Yeah. 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 Listen, Missy, I'm expecting a child. The doctor makes to make me a man. Oh, oh yes. yes. Would you make us some coffee when he comes? And, and, and I cool. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I like the fact that the character that he's talking about not being there is actually downstairs performing in the garden at that stage. Right. Yeah, that's Katie. That's, that's Katie. Pearl. Right? That's Katie playing Pearl. 
and um, she's being talked about as the character. That's part of the beauty of this script, right? You don't, until, yeah, until you produce it, you don't quite see how brilliant it is. Right. And it's also, it's also one of these old national comedies. Yes. Right? There's a whole other storyline going on down there. Yeah, I mean, they were. You had my turn to go back, okay? Every time that I. Good morning, Tracy. No, I just. Look at me. And there's Steve Thorne. He's yeah. back. So. So, um, yeah, go ahead. So that took just uh, on the production end, you had your your typical stage management and crew for each space. So you had a stage manager, assistant stage manager, PAs, stage crew for each space just to do a, the, the normal play, either the house or the garden. But then we had like the Uber stage manager, Chris Borg, who was in our paint shop, which is like in between both theaters at like, you know, like this, the mother station where he had like six or seven monitors seeing all different type places of the set, seeing backstage. So he kind of could in lobby spaces so he could see where everyone was, but then he also had both scripts in, right. in front of him with times and he was timing both shows. And if one show started to get faster or slower, because you also have audience reaction that you don't, you don't, you know, is different every night. And with Garden, there's that whole fountain scene that just stops the play. Right. And yeah. Yeah, and I mean, there's water. so much. Uh, so he's timing everything. And when one play got too far off, and Stephen Thorne has a thing on our Facebook page recently that he talked about the devil eyes come on. And so we had like green, green lights were on when everything was going well. And then when things were going bad and, and the person was not going to make their entrance and you needed to start making stuff up, the big red light came on. Yeah. And then these actors had to, to you know, kind of ad lib, which is also great having a company of actors who have worked with each other so much that it's, you know, second nature to them. Yeah, this is, um, we're, we're going to play another, because um, what, we, we just, what we just showed you, Stephen had plenty of time to get up there. I mean, I used to yeah. watch from backstage and, you know, he would have a good 10 or 15 seconds um, because they don't always know how close the two theaters are, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you have to take an elevator and if there's a yeah. stairway, whatever it is. Um, yeah. But but this was the real feat, was the curtain call. So set it up for us a little bit. Well, this was, so Brian came to me because the way that if you read all of the stuff, the way he wrote it, they're not set to come down at the same time. There's a couple of, of minute difference uh, in that. And, um, and so Brian was like, I want to do single bow curtain calls of every actor in, on, on both stages every night. So which mm -hmm. was like, okay. okay. <laughs> and I mean, and he figured this out. This wasn't on the production end as far as that goes. I mean, it was in timing everything and keeping the actors on yeah. that. But the idea was both shows came down, you know, within seconds of each other. And then wherever you were at that moment, you bowed and then you ran upstairs to the next theater and bowed and ran upstairs. So we have this video. So Peter, do you mind playing it? Um, uh, Peter's uh, put this together side by side so that we can see. Um, oh, well. That's nice. 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 It's interesting because it's the same last line. Same last line, yeah. Right? In both plays. And Trish walks out of the house and um, uh, Teddy's left by himself. All right, now here people are bowing. That was Joe Wilson bowing, yeah. right? And you can see there, this is speeded up just a little bit because it does take a while. Barbara Mee, <laughs> um, Janice too close. Those are little kids that were part of the, they they had a, they were drum majors and, oh, oh, and there's Ted. He realizes he's going out the wrong way and he can't go out that way or <laughs> he'll be in trouble, right? Yep. 
Um, and now you have, okay. So now Joe's in Joe the house. That's how long Joe had to get from downstairs to upstairs. Yeah. And right? you can see they start getting later and later and later and later up in house. Uh. <laughs> and oh, here's, <laughs> yes, there you go. Okay. Um, and then here's Janice. All right. Yeah. And there's Barbara. Uh, <laughs> and, and then, oh, wait. Oh, there's Angela. some more people. Angela. <laughs> and then, oh, no, Steve Thorne. Yeah. It, I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. And crazy. Eight times a week for four and a half weeks. And that was, Eugene Lee said it was brilliant. It was so, what was interesting, because Eugene doesn't necessarily like to do it like what the play says to do. Yes. But it was one of those times where he did this beautiful country house interior, beautiful, fully real, realized garden with an actual tree yeah. that we went out and cut down, right? Well, the, yeah, the tree, the tree bases, the trunks were the two columns that are columns. in there. But yes, we did go out and get actual trees and then hot glued leaves on them. I mean, we sprayed them down with fire spray and then we glued uh, actually, you know, fake leaves on them. Uh, to, <laughs> what we do, man, what we do. Oh, man, this is what adults do for a living. Okay, so you answered, we've got, we've got a couple of questions here. You answered uh, Jim's question about what your favorite set was um, and Lear. Uh, what's been your most heartfelt and fulfilling play, Laura Smith? This person doesn't know you don't have a heart. Um, <laughs> most heartfelt and fulfilling play over the past decade. Um, wow, I mean, there's, a, lucky enough uh, to, have, ha, to have a number of plays that, have, that I will never forget that I've produce. Uh, I will go back to um, Grapes of Wrath. Um, I, I will go back to that. I will also put uh, your ragtime uh, in there as well, just because of what you were showing, especially at the end of that play. Um, I will go back to that. But Grapes of Wrath was just, uh, just a collaboration all around with with the the MFA students that made up the band to the set to to just us doing what we do and and you know and Brian is such a wonderful director to work with so that is one that I could have probably watched every every day um, and that's what got me here. My Fair Lady is also another that is was just that was just a yeah. You know, that was an incredible play as well, so. There, there, it's interesting, I still remember being there, um, you know, that was during the housing crisis and that, mm -hmm. um, that production of Grapes of Wrath really spoke directly to people's experience at that time. Yeah. Um, it was 2010, I think. Close or, to you. Yeah, something right in, in there. And it, it just, um, I don't know, it, it, it the that one because it was set in a bar and it was all around you um it was so uh spectacular and I, I i was with sharon jenkins the other night and she she and i were talking about camelot and okay i okay that might be the most beautiful set uh that is one of the most beautiful sets we've done uh thank, thank you, you for you. mentioning that that yeah. was uh, set in the tube station in, in london it was and I have to set this up in the sense that I, you know, I, and I, I didn't even expect to talk about this tonight, but um, I remember calling up Eugene and saying, hey, Gene, I have this idea to set Camelot during the Blitz of London. And he said, oh, darling, no, no one needs to see that play. And I said, no, 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 I, I know, but that they don't need to see it as swords and sorcery, but I have this idea in my head somewhere, there's the story that um, the that acting companies during the Blitz went and performed on the the um, station platforms, right? Mm -hmm. The station platforms of the tube stops, 
um, and did whole plays there. And the next week, in, in, in just inimitable Eugene Lee fashion, a little manila envelope showed up with a, with a tie on the back and his, his beautiful handwriting on the front and just my name. And I opened it up and it was a photograph that he had found of actors on a tube station platform. And then he made that tube station, no, he drew that tube station platform and we made it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, it was a big, 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 big set. And, and I had to stop right now. And I mean, everyone, but Philip Creech. Oh, uh, I'm so glad that's what I was gonna say. You know, because, you know, the, the subway tiles, I mean, we, <laughs> we took masonite and cut those down and beveled the edges. And I mean, we're talking 19 feet tall, this huge round curve sure. within the, the, the top looked like plaster and aged. And it, I mean, he's a, he's a genius. And that set is one of those. And cobble, uh, homebody cobble, you didn't see that. What was one of, of, you just, I just would sit down there and watch Philip work his magic. That was, you know, making things out of things you wouldn't even think about and making them look aged and worn and you could stand right up to it and not know it's theatrical uh, painting. Um, right. Funny story about Camelot, if we have yeah. time, which is, yeah, yeah. you know, one of the things that we do, especially a lot with Christmas carols, we'll have like, um, you know, uh, swings coming down and beds flying and, you know, we've had rope gags a lot and I am one person that I want to, you know, we build it and then I try it, you know, zip line. Just because if we're asking an actor to do this eight times a week, I want to make sure I feel comfortable doing it and then I can work with them as far as telling them the best way. So I, it was late in, in the Camelot, uh, process and most the of the set process. the tech process. and most of the set had been built and all that stuff and so like I said it was a curve so you couldn't get really to the grid in a lot of areas. And then it was like how you were struggling. I don't know if you were struggling, but it was it was Sir Lancelot's entrance. How were we going to make his first entrance? And so Eugene came up with a great idea of you know where you would see in all the movies of someone would grab onto a rope and in the rope would lower down to the stage and then it would stop right when it got to the stage and you would hop off and then the rope would you know disappear. But there was a lot of things in our way. So we couldn't rig it the way we wanted to, but Carl was like, oh, let me try something. And so he called me up one day. He's like, so you want to come try this? And I'm like, sure. So I stand up on the second level. <laughs> this second, sorry mom. I stand up on the second level uh, you know, railing. And yep. I grab the rope and I jump off and I go flying to the ground. And then it starts slowing down as I'm getting to the stage. And I'm like, oh my God, this is brilliant. And before I could step off, it shot me straight back up into the air. And then it was kind of like a bungee at one point. And I literally <laughs> waited, like I did that like maybe three times and then got like maybe four feet from the ground and I just jumped. And then I looked at Carl, he goes, nope. <laughs> and, so, and so Joe just went <laughs> down. <laughs> so Joe ended up just sliding well, down the rope. That's what we well, ended up. That, and that was, that was within the song, he would climb up and then yeah. slide down because yeah. he actually entered well, and on, on the, the, motor, the yeah. motorcycle, yeah. right? Yeah. He was the American army officer. And, right. and Eugene said, I have an idea. Lancelot should come in on a motorcycle. <laughs> And he did. It was a green bike that we made into a motorcycle. <laughs> it, was yeah, really it was incredible. It, yeah. So those are the kinds of um, things that you can do with the physical setting that really help to tell the story in a in an exciting way. Yeah. And when you get it right. And I think that you said that um, Middletown. Oh, Dev, yeah. O's, Dev O set for Middletown, I think was one of those it did, it was so, well, it looked easy and small, but it, it was stunning, you know. So for those of you uh, who saw it or did not see it, the entire background was like a ground row. I mean, it was like, well, it was like a psych of cardboard, two-ish dimensional um, houses, neighborhood houses. There were 
I don't know. 500? I don't know. How no, I think it's closer to like 800 of 800? them. Uh, and, and like I said, it was, and, and then the set was pieces that moved in and out and all of that stuff, you know, furniture moved in and out, but the set was this backdrop of these houses that took absolutely for, it might be the most expensive labor set we've ever done. You all built them. At a certain yeah. point, you're like, you sent out an email to the all, all staff and you're like, come to the shop. Everyone needs to come and build two. I built two houses. Yeah. Everyone coming built. back at, you know, coming back and making it. And you're sitting there and you're like, and Deb, I love you. I, you're a genius. But I was sitting there making these things going, this is either going to be more, the stupidest thing ever, or it's going to be brilliant. And we put those up and we turned the lights on and it was, it was breathtaking. It was brilliant. It was absolutely one of, uh, just like, you're like, who, who could have thunk? Uh, yeah. But all of her sets are like that. They're they're just stunning. Yeah, I mean that that one I remember like the sunset on those houses it made me cry because yeah. it was just it was like a small town, just you know captured in an in an in an art installation. It was yeah. incredible. And, and Josh did a great job uh, lighting oh. those and gave them depth. Uh, yeah, and with, and dimensionality and warmth. Okay, so I have a question because I've never asked you this question. Um, what's the what's the craziest uh, mishap you've ever seen or been part of on a stage? Like, you just mentioned the thing with the rope and. Um, well, what? I mean, almost every Christmas Carol. <laughs> I knew Christmas Carol was going to be in the top ten, if not the top okay. two. There, yeah, there. I mean, there's a, there haven't been an insane amount. Um, I, I will say that there always, generally, every once in a while, there is an elevator mishap with Christmas Carol, and you just you just figure it out, and and you don't stop the show. You you know, unless it's dangerous, you don't stop the show. But it the elevator was like maybe two feet from reaching the top, and it just it just stopped. So we all ran down there. They're acting. We tried to push it up. Uh, it wasn't moving. So we braced it to where it just it couldn't move. And we were like, this is this is it. This is where it's going to be. <laughs> and I remember Stephen Thorne. We're talking about Stephen a lot tonight. I remember Stephen Thorne came in as Cratchit. And he was like, oh, what a lovely sunken dining room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And it was just what, and we had to get notes to Brian because Brian McElhaney was playing Scrooge who never leaves the set. So we had to get notes to him that the elevator wasn't working because the gravestone wasn't going to come up on it and all that stuff. And I believe Stephen wrote on his uh, solicitor, not solicitor, uh, the three. Uh, oh. Uh, no, wait, that, the solicitors, the guys. No, that no, the three, the three not nice people and people. Oh, oh the, um, the exchange men. The exchange, the royal exchange. He wrote on his briefcase and a piece of paper, elevator not working, no gravestone or something like that. And he was in the scene and he held it up to where the audience couldn't see it, but Brian could read it <laughs> and did the the thing. So that is one. Recently was, was um, a uh, little shop of horror. Uh, oh, right. Where, uh, where the cables, you know, drooped down and got caught. So we had to hold uh, the set. And I was on the back of a chair and heels, you know, taking it back up. But uh, and, and that that was on opening night too. That I was believe. on opening night. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll, I'll have to say the most incredible thing I've ever witnessed, and it had nothing to do with scenery or, or production at that point, was an, uh, was when one of my first first or second year, early on, uh, we were doing A Christmas Carol, and uh, the late Barbara Orson was playing Mrs. Fezziwig, and we were downstairs. It was running, but we were downstairs uh, taking a show, and uh, one of the stage managers from Christmas Carol came down and goes, uh, Barbara fell during a dance and broke her wrist. And so I went up there and I went to the dressing room because we had taken her out of a couple of things and it was, it was, it was broken. 
And I said, Barbara, do you want to go to the hospital? And she goes, no, the show, we need to finish the show. So she's like, just give me some ice and a bandage and ice and bandaged it up. Tim was playing Scrooge uh, that year and she grabbed her. It was, you know, the end stave where Mrs. Fezziwig goes on and he chases her around and, you know, this Christmas is part, This is partlet. This is partlet, part sorry, this is partlet. And she grabs that tray with both hands, walks on that stage, does her blocking, which was rolling around on the bed uh, while Tim chased her, did it flawlessly, ran off, came off stage and she's like, I'd like to go to the hospital now. And I was like, bow, <laughs> bow <Yeah>. down <laughs> to yeah. you. That, that, that is the essence of the show must go that, on. That is the essence of the show must go on. I will never forget that at, at all. Now, um, so we have, a, we have a couple more questions. Uh, one is, what's been your favorite Christmas carol? I, ha I actually have an answer to that one. But um, do you want me to go oh, first? Yes. No, you can go first. Yeah, you go I'm first. Really, some, it was it was um, Angela Brazil and Stephen Thorne's Christmas yeah. Carol. That, that was a that was a wonderful one, especially with the, the community and all of that stuff. It was just a it was an incredible way to tell the story. I'm I guess I'm more horrible than you because my favorite one was Kevin Moriarty and Michael McGarty, where we had the furnace and the fire shooting out and we had a kid throw up on the first performance, but kids ran from that theater on a daily basis. And that is my favorite Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas to you too, Laura. <laughs> um, the other question that we just got is, is there a recent time we've used puppets? <laughs> I didn't make that up. That's right there. It's not me. They, whoever that is should be banned. <laughs> I hate puppets. I hate puppets. Well, so whoever asked that question, thank you. I, I love puppets, which is why Laura's saying what she's saying. We uh, The last time that we used them were, was in uh, Beowulf, A Thousand Years Baggage, yes. um, which actually, like the I, I just watched that sequence uh, with Annie and uh, Charlie doing the... Um, the overhead projector. Oh, that was a work of genius. Yeah, that was that was fantastic. Um, and those puppets were. I mean, the only frustration I have with with puppets is that you 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 don't have the. Sometimes you can't afford, or you, you just the person that's making the puppets just uh, isn't there to manipulate and help and and teach. There's never enough time. Right. There seems to be. Um, or they just don't listen to your dimensions and then they build things that don't fit. <laughs> They're supposed to fit, but we won't talk about it. Oh my gosh. But the, um, I do also remember the thing that, again, watching Beowulf, the, the, the dragon at the end, where, um, and McCarty was the one I think that came up with the, he goes, you know how you have those garbage cans that hang down in a construction th site and you throw trash down it? That looks like a dragon's tail. Yeah. And if you watch that final sequence where there's a head and wings, but then this garbage can tail that's like yeah. thrashing around, it was yeah. just no, incredible. It was, that, that was, like I said, that was the last time. They have been mentioned since then, but we haven't seen them. <laughs> hmm. A Christmas carol? Um, anyway, uh, Laura Smith, I really can't thank you enough. You are uh, a treasure of the American theater. Oh, oh, thank you. Don't get to say that very often in public, but it's true. Thank and you. anyone who knows you knows that. And there are very few people who love the theater as much as you do. I For do, someone right? who professes that she hates watching plays, um, you it's, really do love the theater. Look, it's like, you know, it's, it's a, a job that never ends, but it truly is a one of the most fulfilling jobs I think anyone could have. And I feel lucky every day to, to get to do what I do, but get, it's more about the people that you get to do it with, uh, that make it just that more. Um, and the Trinity Rep family are just some of the best people there ever been. Yeah. And I miss them. That's true. You're one of them. So thanks. Thank um, you. 
in order to take us out, we're going to see one of those family members, Stephen Thorne, um, uh, talking about uh, House and Garden, actually. Uh, we'll see you on October 1st, no, sorry, September 17th for our next show. Um, and, uh, and thanks for joining us tonight. Peter, whenever you're ready, let's play Steve Thorne. We had all these plans in place about, oh, what happens if so-and-so doesn't make an entrance, or this happens, or the timing gets off, or one audience is laughing more than the other audience. We opened the show, everything went well, it kept going well, kept going well through the entire run. We were amazed with ourselves, we were so pleased. Um, late in the run, during the play House upstairs, I was doing a scene with Fred Sullivan Jr. Uh, it was pretty early in the play, and we were getting to the end of our scene, and like I said, we were late in the run, so we were feeling very confident, we were in a good rhythm. And Fred was saying one of his lines, and I can't remember any of the text, but he was speaking, and suddenly he just started going like this. Literally, he started talking like he was underwater or had been hit by a slow-motion ray of some sort. So I looked over to him, and the only thought I had was something's wrong with Fred. Something's happened. Why is he doing this? What's going on? And it felt like about 40 years, but it was probably about 20 seconds. And as I listened to him continue on and kind of vamp and hem and haw and talk very slow, I realized we had put in place this backup, 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 backup plan that if someone was not going to make an entrance, the person in the booth was going to turn on what we called the red devil eye lights. So they were these two, I don't even know if it was two or one, but now... In this telling of it, there were two eyes, two red eyes, these red lights up in the uh, stage manager's booth that basically said, you're on your own, something's happened, just vamp. <laughs> so for whatever reason, these red uh, lights had gone on because the timing was off on, on the two shows and Fred was vamping. And I, I consider myself very fortunate to have been on stage with Fred because if anybody can vamp, it's Fred. But there he was talking very slowly and my mind was racing trying to remember, well, what was our plan? We have to, we had to improvise something. And I remember it involved me breaking down and hugging him. So I just basically went over and hugged him as hard as I could and began to sweat profusely, just crossing my fingers and praying to God that, that the actor was gonna show up. And this went on, like I said, for what felt like 40 years, it was probably about 45 seconds. Um, but eventually the other actor did come on and uh, we were able to continue on with the play. But it was a thrilling, unpredictable moment uh, in Trinity Rep lore when the red devil eyes came on and <laughs> we were underwater for about a minute of the play. Thank you, everyone. Great show tonight. As a reminder, we are off next week. There is no show next week. So we will see you back here two Thursdays from now for another 7.30 p.m. half hour. Thanks. Have a great night.